So we are extremely delighted to have uh, Professor Sanjay Bhattacharya, uh, who's currently the co-director of the History Department Center for Global His Health Histories, uh, and the professor in the History of Medicine, uh, and also the Wellcome Trust Senior Investigator, and involved with the WHO uh, as part of Global Health Histories. He's currently located at the University of York. Sanjay was earlier with the Wellcome Trust. And his interests are vast and varied. Um, he brings together ways of understanding health, medical, political, and social histories of 19th and 20th century India. And I was actually uh, very keen that we be able to bring in somebody like Sanjay to speak to us at a time uh, when we are struggling with different aspects of the pandemic and very often unable to really understand or comprehend what uh, governments are doing. So a very warm welcome, Sanjay, uh, and over to you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Anu, for inviting me uh, for this uh, chance to interact with scholars uh, in a state that I've never visited. Um, I'm, I will look forward to visiting you physically when it's possible Absolutely. and safe to do so. Yes. Um, uh, I'm a great admirer of the Kerala education system and the health system. And so it's an absolute honor from that perspective to also be involved in this event. So I'm now going to uh, share, I think, uh, my PowerPoint with all of you. Um, come on. Uh, please forgive the delay. And now share. Okay, I'm unsure if you can see it. Has it uploaded? We can see it, uh, but if you shift to the view uh, option, then I think we'll see it better. The view. Yeah. No. Oh, that's close now. Should you slideshow? Slideshow, perfect, thank you. Play from we... start. Play from start now. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Sham. Uh, okay. So, um, you know, Anu was very generous in uh, describing my varied interests, and I do indeed have varied interests, and I've consistently believed uh, that it's very, very important and useful uh, for uh, historians who specialize in different uh, varieties of history, be it political, social, cultural, medical, health, environmental history, to come together. Uh, because you know when we talk about interdisciplinarity, uh, which is the new buzzword in many new in circles, even though interdisciplinary work, interdisciplinary collaborations, have been long standing. Um, it is possible to work across methodologies, uh, across uh, disciplines when one is trying to deal with a problem. In my case, it's usually health. Uh, but what I often find is that people forget in such a situation to ensure that historians working in different sort of fields with different methods somehow forget to collaborate as well. And I think there's much to be learned from each other and much uh, uh, to be uh, achieved uh, through combining multiple uh, methodologies. So for example, I, I firmly believe that it's very, very useful for, for um, uh, you know, Colleagues in in the in 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 involved in the implementation of international global health policies, uh, to have access to sort of cultural and social history or political history methodologies where they can understand uh, 
which they can deploy and then better understand the context in which uh, uh, they seek to work in uh, uh, so that they can adapt policies appropriately to make it relevant and understandable to communities. And that is uh, my aim today, to use some of my work uh, to perhaps suggest to all of you how this can be done, uh, not as a prescription, uh, but you know, just as an attempt to throw uh, the cat among the pigeons and also invite all of you uh, to come up with more ideas uh, because so much uh, is really possible. So let me start in the 19th century. In 1857, uh, which is of course an important sort of political moment in British India, uh, the UK general, UK's General Board of Health declared to both houses of British Parliament that the very success of smallpox vaccination may have blinded people to its importance. So this is a very interesting document and it highlighted the dangerous nature of smallpox. Uh, the need to control it because it was so dangerous, uh, the fact that it could kill a lot of people, and also uh, the aim, uh, the political aim of the document was to try and mobilize support uh, for, for the idea that uh, vaccination coverage needed to be expanded. Um, now, when one studies this document, but, but more importantly, the raw material that went into producing this doc, 1857 document, for me, certain features stand out. And those features are that the science uh, is not certain. The science is quite variable. There are multiple scientific views. Uh, and because there are multiple scientific views, uh, there are multiple scientific postulations. And because there are multiple scientific postulations, there are wide range of policies that are being recommended, uh, implemented, uh, evaluated, evidence being gathered from such evaluation for the proposal that a new vaccination, smallpox vaccination policy be launched in the UK. And what is very clear in the raw material also is that there's variable social responses simply because there is so much uh, variation in official policy. This often is ignored by historians, I will argue, because there is a tendency to overgeneralize uh, the unity of policies, uh, where I, I, I would suggest that historians sometimes fall prey to the biases, the very biases that some of these documents are trying to sort of embed in public discourse. Now, using this 1857 document as an example of variation, I posit to you, I submit to all of you, that there are even greater levels of variation in science, practice and response across British Empire, and especially British India, which was, as all of you know, a very, very complex uh, political uh, uh, and social and social cultural unit. So at this point, I just want to quickly explain the difference between variolation and vaccination, but not just explain in sort of uh, overgeneralized ways, but also highlight to you that in both these practices, there was variation, variation clearly being uh, the sort of underpinning theme in my talk uh, to you today. So in relation to variolation, uh, 
smallpox was often seen as a poison. Uh, so the pustular material, uh, you know, smallpox would cause, cause pustules and there would be pus inside and uh, uh, that pustular material was also seen as such a poison. Variolation, as an idea, was based on the use of such poison, but a weakened form of such poison. Therefore, you know, if you read tracts carefully, and there are different tracts, uh, and so you have to be very aware of the biases uh, that underpin the preparation of these, ta uh, of these um, tracks. Uh, generally speaking, uh, all these texts mentioned how, uh, or reports mentioned how variolators would look to collect uh, poison that they would use for variolation from mild cases, so which would then be sort of aged, weakened further, and then used. So the idea uh, that uh, weak forms of the disease needed to be used for variolation was, was prevalent. Where scabs, dried scabs were collected, uh, the tracks, many tracks tell us uh, uh, that they were aged and dried before being reused for variolation. And they were reconstituted before use again, uh, variably, uh, sometimes with oil, sometimes with honey, etc. different uh, kinds of uh, uh, reconstitution material were used. Now it is in this context, we have to remember that early smallpox vaccination which begins uh, to get popularized around the world uh, in the 1800s uh, was often also uh, uh, seen to be based on a poison. Why? Because cowpox, which is also a pox disease, but in cows, which was used in the UK in Great Britain um, in early smallpox vaccines, was also regularly referred to as a poison, not just by detractors and people who resisted vaccination, but also people who were talking about the disease uh, from a pro-vaccination stance uh, before multiple germ theories or interpretations of germ theories uh, became more widely prevalent. So uh, all boxes were seen as poisons. What happens in British India is that when there is an effort by the British authorities in London to try and popularize vaccination across British India, is that the people who are given the responsibility to develop a smallpox vaccine in British India find that cowpox is very rare uh, and sometimes impossible to find uh, in British India. So what then happens is that animal pox is manufactured. So naturally occurring uh, cow pox or animal pox is not used. A process is created in British India where animals are multiple kinds of animals are given pox, buffaloes, goats, you know, camels, all sorts of experiments were carried out, uh, donkeys in some instances, uh, are given the pox by giving human smallpox to animals, which then gave the uh, animal, uh, animal pox. And that animal pox was then mind, that is one of the words that was used, uh, uh, and, 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 or farmed, another word, and that material was then used for early vaccination. So it's very important, I think, for all of us, whether we're in history or in public health, to look at science, to look at technology in its own terms, in its own context, and not be presentist, because as I'll argue, 
uh, a bit later, one of the big problems we have is presentism, where we tend to look at pro-vaccinationism and anti-vaccinationism uh, uh, in ways where we imagine the vaccine that was used uh, in an earlier age, whether it's 200 years ago or whether it was 30 years ago, in ways that we see the, va the vaccine now, and that wasn't the case. Vaccines were quite different uh, in the past. And so if we have to understand support, compliance, resistance, of violent opposition, we need to understand what it is people were seeing, experiencing, and then opposing. So this then brings me to the question of 19th century vaccine hesitancy and resistance. So was it only about religion and superstition when one looks at the colonial files? or even post-colonial files, some of the WHO files? Was it only about Shitala, who's one of whose sort of representations uh, I, I, I use on this slide? Again, it's a variation. Was vaccination always secular? Because you know some British Indian officials would claim that vaccination was opposed because it was secular, whereas by relation, was more sort of cultural, more religious. Not necessarily always, because you know there are multiple reports, let's say from Bombay Presidency, which show that vaccinators would, uh, especially where money was uh, there to be made, would would often uh, latch on a very variolation like cultural celebrations with vaccination work. Yes. There were places in which the use of cows was opposed. But what does that mean? It wasn't the use of cowpox or pustular material from cowpox that was necessarily opposed. What was being opposed was narratives of cruelty against the animal. That is, an animal being given human smallpox along Scar, sort of wounds made along the animal's body with uh, human smallpox being put into those wounds to generate artificially uh, animal pox. So when you read the files carefully, what is being opposed often is the violence and the pain that is clearly being inflict inflicted on the animal. And why is this important? Because in the very early uh, smallpox vaccination practices, basically first humans and then cows would be given sort of be used as sort of vessels in which uh, the vaccine pox uh, would be carried and they would be walked from village to village with material being taken first out of human hands and then animal bodies and then being given. Uh, to other human beings as protection against smallpox. And, 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 and it is absolutely true that in some contexts, the use of cows in such a way was opposed. And so buffaloes, goats, and donkeys, etc., were also used. But there were many contexts where the use of other animals was also opposed. So it's a much more complex, variable story. And when you try to investigate this further, what is very clear is that sometimes the problem is simply vegetarianism. There's opposition to all animal matter. So the point I'm trying to make to all of you today is that it's very important not to be presentist and remember that early vaccination so in the 19th century was not based on an exact science and was usually very painful, both for the human being who was cut in multiple points in the arms, or you know, uh, not usually in the legs, usually the arms, the different parts of the arms. Um, uh, but also, equally, it was very painful uh, uh, for the animal that was providing uh, the early vaccine. The problem, of course, was that when you read 
unpublished material or unpublished evaluations, you will see that there is an acceptance that early vaccination often did not take. And when you consider that some of the vaccination was targeted at children about six months to 18 months old who uh, were uh, the most likely not to have had smallpox and therefore had an Im immunity, uh, uh, efforts to revaccinate children who had received the first painful vaccination often led to opposition. So these are the main, many complexities I see in the colonial and post-colonial archives because similar trends continued after the Second World War II, actually, because you know, while urban vaccination became much more reliable thanks to refrigeration and other technological um, uh, advances, rural vaccination remained weak and, and the lack of electrification, for instance, after 1947 in villages meant that vaccine storage was a problem and which meant that children would be vaccinated quite painfully uh, with rotary lancets and they would not take. And, and, and similar issues and similar bases for hesitancy and resistance continued. But I submit to all of you, there is a historiographical problem here too. I call presentism a pitfall and I mean it. I, you know, there is many historians write uh, and, and, and especially sort of clinicians who fancy themselves as historians, you know, when they write about medical practice and technology in the past, they often look at the most current technology and just imagine as if that is what existed in the past. And that certainly wasn't the case. And practice and science is often considered out of practice. And this is, I think, a particular problem uh, with Eurocentric and sort of North American centric historians who love studying the lab, who love studying history of discoveries. They love studying uh, sort of complexity in the history of discovery and do a lot of complex work there but cannot seem to understand that the history of the lab and the history of science in relation to history of science is quite different from the history of public health, which involves implementation, negotiation, social and political negotiation and variation in context. Uh, so, so I think there is a space for sort of, uh, doing history of science, which examines the complexities of discovery and, and the negotiations that go with discovery and the recognition of discovering and the naming of a problem, the naming of a disease, you know, all those are very, very important, but somehow I think that need to be connected with sort of deeper sort of social and political and cultural history uh, processes that allow them to understand that once a technology leaves, the laboratory or the factory, there is another history and that other history is often not studied. So I would say that such historians of science then criticize hesitancy uh, as, as, uh, on the basis of their own idealizations. That is not actual practices and difficulties on the ground. These are the historians who will often talk about superstitions and culture in the most simplistic terms to try and explain why this wonderful technology that they have studied being developed in the lab is then so difficult to implement on the ground. And it is here that I would argue that the historians culture based presumptions play a role uh, in imparting layers and layers of bias to their study of the history of science and medicine. Uh, I mean, I've often encountered uh, multiple historians of medicine who are termed excellent because they've got funded by some well-known funders uh, who write about South Asia, but have hardly visited South Asia, certainly don't have the languages, uh, might have had a curry in London's East End and seem to think that India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, or indeed British India uh, must have been a slightly less developed uh, version of London's East End and therein lies your problem. Therein lies the uh, simplification, the bias that then comes in to create history 
like that. And uh, uh, apart from the sort of political uh, stance, I mean, some of them uh, are uh, simply by being quite conservative in their politics, uh, have a worldview where the ideas debark, uh, especially to people who look different from them, uh, should be blindly accepted rather than uh, explained, negotiated, uh, uh, respectfully, un problem respectfully understood, etc. So, so uh, liberal historiography can often be a very illiberal space, as I'm sure all all of you know. But you know, it's very very clear when one sees how history of pandemic controls. Uh, are written where uh, the science is studied in complexity, but not its implementation and its reception. And, 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 and that, that needs to be, in my opinion, be called out. So there are some continuities I'd like to highlight to you. Uh, uh, vaccine production and use was formalized uh, uh, very slowly in the first half of the 20th. Uh, century. Uh, in the British Indian context, each province had its own production, storage, uh, distribution, usage methods. So what I'm trying to say to all of you that there were many smallpox vaccines with variable impact, not, di not dissimilar to what we're seeing with COVID. There are many types of vaccine, each with its characteristics, each with, with its side effects, each with its sort of communication strategies, uh, linked to commercial interests. So all these are coming together uh, to create a sort of uh, mosaic uh, of, 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 uh, of, of uh, vaccine information. And as these many vaccines were uh, in British India, small, as these many smallpox vaccines were, in, uh, were used in British India, it was therefore uh, not surprising that there were the, uh, variable and multiple civilian responses. Civilians not, were not responding to a specific science. This is what I'm trying to highlight to all of you. Uh, 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 and once you look at that complexity uh, of the existence of multiple sciences uh, and then uh, responses, multiple responses to multiple sciences, then the religious response that is often used by British Indian officials, usually European officials, as an excuse for their inability to do their work properly, uh, it is there that the religious response becomes an excuse generally and is really only a partial influence in determine, determining hesitancy and resistance. So, you know, I'm, I'm aware that I'm running out of time. So I'm going to very quickly uh, look at what I think happened after the Second World War. Trends after the Second World War were no less variable. There was a variation in vaccinal products vaccination methods and delivery mechanisms. So, you know, one form of vaccination is represented here in this image. Uh, that was the vaccinating gun, uh, which was considered uh, uh, very efficient because apparently you could vaccinate a lot of people very quickly. Uh, now, what is very important to remember is that conceptions of effic efficiency changed at one point where the gun was uh, uh, invented, efficiency was defined as the number of people you uh, vaccinated in a day. I mean, that definition never disappeared, but other issues also uh, came into changing the definitions of efficiency. And one of them was witnessing of side effects or post-vaccinal uh, complications caused by infection after vaccination. Uh, there were fears, for instance, amongst officials themselves, usually expressed in unpublished material, that the needle uh, used in the vaccination gun to vaccinate was not being sterilized and therefore could lead 
to post vaccinal complications. Uh, such narratives, discussions, debates, which were often held in technical organizations behind closed doors, uh, uh, did seep out these, these closed doors. You could close doors, but you couldn't seal uh, uh, the information into a room. Um, it is very important to remember that people who actually ran these programs were not a hundred and so international workers, but hundreds of thousands of national health workers lived in communities, were linked to communities, spoke to communities about some of the things, uh, problems, successes, the good and the bad being discussed in the rooms which some international officials hoped and imagined as hermetically sealed sort of spaces, but they weren't. The information seeped out, uh, things were discussed in communities, uh, and information was spread out, and therefore there would be community concerns about the very concerns that were being discussed by technical person and personnel within closed rooms. The difference, of course, being is that when a group of international workers discusses international uh, the concerns about possible uh, cross-infection or side effects, uh, since it's being done secretly, uh, that is supposed to be scientific and, and thoughtful, but similar sort of concerns in communities were immediately uh, 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 sort of labeled as superstition or illogical. There's a politics in such labeling as well, which history reminds us uh, was deeply marked by hypocrisy, um, uh, which current, I think, public health workers, especially international and global health workers, need some reminding of uh, simply because we can hope that that would make them more humble and humility usually is a very, very valuable commodity in the success of immunization programs and especially now pandemic response programs. You know, you uh, gain a lot more history teaches us through collaboration and empathy than you do with violence and uh, uh, exclusive uh, sort of decision-making. So in the 1950s, after the Second World War, you see different kinds of wet vaccine throughout the world, but it's, and also in India, being produced by all these different state uh, vaccination, uh, vaccine production units. And, 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 and later in the 1960s, the dry, the more thermostable, the more effective, efficacious vaccine uh, becomes prevalent. But even here, there's variation because there's a Soviet freeze-dried vaccine, there's a Canadian freeze-dried vaccine, there's a British freeze-dried vaccine, there's a Canadian freeze-dried vaccine. All of these are given to the worldwide smallpox eradication program being coordinated from within the WHO at headquarters and regional office levels and then distributed by the WHO in sort of, you know, in a mix and match way, you know. Uh, that was the great role played by the WHO that it could take both American and Soviet vaccine and target it into, in territories that needed it because it was a mass smallpox outbreak, which had, a, had the danger of becoming a greater regional outbreak. Um, and, 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 you know, the WHO uh, could, could uh, you know, send, let's say, a Soviet freeze red vaccine into a political system, a country that identified itself as a U.S. ally because public health was more important than the Cold War politics of the time. And that is where I think the WHO had a very important role to play. Not every official in the WHO, but many officials in the WHO. Uh, some uh, 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 WHO officials were, of course, infected by the Cold War virus as well. But the point remains is that the history of successful smallpox eradication is history of, of, of how the more internationalist, more democratic people managed to develop louder voices and more powerful actions than the ones who tried to limit on the lines of politics. That is the main lesson for me for smallpox eradication. Because there were all these different kinds of vaccines, there were different forms uh, 
uh, of hesitancy and resistance, even in the 1960s and 1970s. One of the people I interviewed uh, in London when I worked for the Wellcome Trust Center for the History of Medicine was uh, Dr. Larry Brilliant, very interesting character. He, he was actually not a part of the United uh, States Centers for Disease Control team. He was American, but he was a hippie and he drove across uh, in, uh, in, a, in a yellow Volkswagen van from Europe uh, across Iran, across Afghanistan, those were more in innocent times, across Pakistan and came to India because he wanted to convert to Hinduism. So uh, he, he identified a guru who would convert him, uh, 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 a gentleman who uh, had his ashram in the Himalayas and he drove up to the Himalayas and uh, sat at the feet of this chap and asked him to convert him, who then gave him a name, I think his Hindu name is Subramaniam, uh, which he struggled to pronounce, uh, uh, which perhaps explains why he uh, continues to use the word name Larry uh, rather than Subramaniam, where his wife, who was named Girija, uh, had, has actually uses a Hindu name, Girija, brilliant, another uh, very important figure in smallpox eradication, uh, but oft ignored, A, because she's a woman, um, and B, because she didn't have the US Centers for Disease Control sort of association. But you know, these are voices worth excavating and using. So Larry Brilliant, uh, 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 this converted Hindu, very committed to Hinduism, asked the guru how he can help the world. The guru tells him, uh, go to the World Health Organization. They're doing something very important. They're working on smallpox eradication. Go and join the World Health Organization. So Larry obediently drives his Volkswagen van down to Delhi, goes to uh, IP Interpreter Road, I think, isn't it? Where the WHO offices, the Southeast Asia Regional Office was based. And the guard had one look at this hippie uh, in, in, in colorful clothes and booted him out of the premises. So off uh, Larry went back to his guru in the Himalayas and said, you know, guru, I tried my best, uh, but they kicked me out, what do I do? And the guru then tells him, oh, you mustn't ever give up, try again. Those who give up are not truly spiritual. So, uh, so Mr. Subramaniam, AKA Larry wanted to show that he was not one of these fair weather Hindus. So he drove down again. And as luck would have it, Donald A. Henderson, um, uh, uh, the chief of the smallpox eradication unit in WHO headquarters, Geneva, was in Delhi, about to enter the Sierra office when Larry uh, entered uh, the sort of compound. So India was going through a smallpox outbreak at that precise point. DA Henderson had arrived in Delhi to sort of see what was being done to control this outbreak. They needed all hands, hands on deck uh, when he heard this American accent shouting at him, requesting his attention, he turned around, spoke to this guy uh, and said, are you a doctor? Once he, he was convinced Larry was a doctor, he actually employed Larry and that's how Larry joined the smallpox eradication campaign. And I've actually seen the telegram from Donald A. Henderson sent from Delhi to Geneva after he met Larry and he said, I'm not sure if, if I've done the right thing and I might live to regret my decision, but we do need all hands on board and I've chosen this young man to join our new Delhi team. So it's very interesting when one reads Larry's papers or Larry's narratives, which of course change because Larry is also, you know, all global health actors are political. Uh, I mean, they use the word global solidarity and and accuse others of not being supporters of solidarity when their politics is opposed. But everyone in global health is political. And when one reads uh, Larry's or Subramaniam, whatever you want to call him, uh, shifting narratives, and the narratives do shift uh, depending on the politics of the place where he's writing the narrative for. Uh, what is fascinating to see is Larry says that resistance was not always re religious. Sometimes it was, but sometimes it wasn't. And he's very good at describing the differences in the variations in hesitancy and resistance. And 
uh, his narratives for me are especially interesting because here is an American who thinks he's now a Hindu who's writing about uh, Hindu uh, resistance uh, in, in, in Eastern India to forcible smallpox vaccination. So I just wanted to flag up this voice to you. Uh, I have no doubt there'll be hundreds and thousands of other voices that can be excavated, but you are better placed than I to uncover and record this, these voices of and memories of smallpox eradication before they disappear because so many of these ex-smallpox workers are now dying. Uh, simply because of old age. So it's very important to record as many voices as possible so that we disabuse institutional histories of the view that it was only about international workers. As I keep saying, the hand that holds the vaccine is often more important than the vaccine itself. And one of the reasons smallpox eradication worked was because there were hundreds of thousands of very effective hands in every major sort of Asian country that managed to get rid of this dreaded, absolutely dreadful disease. So a reliable vaccine without side effects was important. As was communicating information about such a vaccine, attendant technologies were important too. So the early technology were scarifiers or rotary lancets. They were instruments of torture. They were metal bars with metallic teeth at the end. Many of you will have parents or many of you are too young to be vaccinated against smallpox, but oldies like myself and uh, your parents, your uncles and aunts will mostly have marks either on their thighs or their arms representing where they were vaccinated with the rotary lancet. So vaccination initially in the uh, 40s, 50s and 60s, even with modern wet vaccines was a painful affair. They would leave deep holes in your arms, scars that could get infected. You know, vaccination was never a pleasant uh, experience. The bifurcated needle, which comes in in 1970s, which is pictured here, is a major advance. It's a sewing needle with a flattened head. You did not make a, a deep hole in, 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 uh, in someone's arms. You basically uh, created uh, uh, small punctures in which you then introduced the vaccine. So it was a less invasive vaccination process with lower chances of post-operative infection. And, and, and this meant that this was a major factor in the reduction of nervousness, hesitancy, and sometimes resistance. So as I keep trying to uh, highlight here during this talk, that the hands that hold the vaccine uh, are crucial. The tech is important, but it's very dangerous and uh, to, to be technologically deterministic, especially in current times when the technological narrative is, it's, is itself very political and used for political purposes. Uh, we should not ever let public bodies uh, forget that uh, the hands that hold the tech are very important so that we make sure that our governments pay proper regard to the training uh, and the maintenance of human resources, which are very, very, very important. So this then quickly brings me to the last couple of slides, uh, which deal with communication and vaccine delivery. I want to submit to you that the improvement of vaccine stability and immune responses were insufficient on their own. What do I mean by that? Yes, I've just told you how the bifurcated needle made pe pe some people less nervous of vaccination and therefore re reduce resistance in some contexts. But nevertheless, the nature of the vaccine how they were used, what impact it would have on the body had to be communicated. And this 
had to be done side by side with smallpox surveillance. That is, where is the disease? Where do we need to vaccinate? Who do we need to isolate? Are we providing the facilities for effective isolation? Because there was a recognition, all of that was important uh, for popular or community support for isolation uh, regimes uh, where the state had to step in and provide uh, sort of financial or food support uh, without which people would just not isolate. People would go out uh, uh, and try and make a living because many of them had to work every day to survive. So a good public health system, a good pandemic response system, as smallpox eradication shows us, was one that looked at all aspects, including this aspect, which was linked to the communication strategy that went hand in hand with smallpox eradication. So smallpox eradication did not just happen because of a vaccine. I know it happened because of the hundreds of thousands of effective, uh, uh, very effective acceptable hands that were deployed to, to, to take the vaccine to the communities. But smallpox eradication was also based on very, very effective community engagement and thoughtful engagement where facilities were provided uh, in collaboration by national, state, and international government governance to provide uh, sustainable ways of isolating uh, and, 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 uh, and, 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 and community support. Uh, these things are expensive, as we know, as we're learning even in the COVID period, uh, and, 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 and taxpayers' money and aid money had to be used thoughtfully, carefully, transparently, and ethically, and it was, and that was one of the big factors in the success of the smallpox eradication program. And it is here that the local workers, uh, who were the implement implementation leaders, as I like to call them, uh, not the lead, uh, even when there were international workers in play, which you see that descriptions of them being led by international workers in institutional histories. That is not my understanding. I call the local workers, the implementation leaders. They played an immense role in every Indian state uh, and, 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 uh, and, and also um, in the WHO because they would often send uh, evaluations that were read carefully in WHO offices in New Delhi and Geneva, which then led to the sort of reorganization, reshaping of international policy, which is often ignored because historians often just look at the initial document, a report. They don't see usually or often look at the raw material that goes into making the report. And therefore those evaluations uh, uh, from the ground that went to create a report, usually written in a European language or a UN language, usually in English really, uh, by a bunch of white folk. Uh, only the white folk are sort of lionized and remembered, but all the raw material that goes in into their work and informs their work. And the authors, the many brown and black authors who inform their work, then tend to get ignored. So what we have to remember is that resistance, official resistance, those bureaucratic resistance and community, civilian resistance, official resistance would also often emanate from ignoring of local strengths, local uh, contributions. Uh, for instance, the, the systematic uh, act of forgetting local contributions uh, by uh, uh, sort of brown black workers in smallpox eradication led to suspicion, for example, when those very workers were encouraged to support uh, the polio vaccination program. Um, so, I end by asking all of you to consider what is being resisted. Was it the vaccine? Was it the mechanisms that brought the vaccine, uh, the, the vaccine to the field? Uh, 
the communications that I just spoke about, the claims about who was responsible for success or failure, was it the lack of humanity? Fours were sometimes used. Uh, I've seen advertisements, I've spoken to people who, whose only uh, strength in the CV was that they were six foot tall and non-Indian who were needed, uh, uh, but based in India, who were needed in programs so that they could flatten uh, Indians who would then be forcibly vaccinated. Uh, is it possible that what is being resisted is a refusal to acknowledge, acknowledge challenges on the ground? There's some very powerful work in relation to polio vaccination in South Asia, which suggests that when polio vaccination campaigns were resisted, it was not just resisted because polio was not considered uh, a problem, but people on the ground, communities on the ground thought there were multiple problems and they couldn't understand why the many problems, some larger than polio were not being dealt with, but they were being asked to volunteer to end one problem that is polio when there were hundreds of problems and there was a lack of communication there. Therefore, you know, one of these pictures is from Pakistan, the one on the top where uh, polio eradication campaigns have been reduced to sort of quasi-military campaigns requiring armed, guard, armed sort of guard, uh, but wholly dependent, almost wholly almost 99 percent dependent on national workers because health and safety uh, procedures in high-income countries prevents uh, international workers from going into such dangerous places. But it's okay for black and brown people to go into dangerous places. I mean, what and one of the things that annoys me greatly, and I know as a source of resistance, is often uh, the inability to even name or remember the names of the people who are killed in the line of such duty, uh, usually women vaccinators in Pakistan. Uh, the Pakistani government and media mentions them, but when you look at uh, 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 sort of high income country based reporting, whether it's from global charitable funders who are pushing for the polio eradication program, or sometimes even in the WHO offices in Geneva, there is no naming of these uh, people. But, you know, if, you know, one high income country person dies, then there's, of course, naming, there's commemoration. But, you know, there's inequality even in death. So that then creates resistance amongst communities. Uh, but, you know, systems don't seem to recognize that. Uh, so I would like to end by just reminding people here that my research suggests that human resources matters. The human factor is key to reducing uh, hesitancy. Trust means low resistance, low hesitancy, but trust needs to be earned. Trust needs to be developed on the basis of hard work. It can't be demanded. It can't be forced. Sadly, these are lessons that are often deliberately ignored in polio eradication. And we can discuss that if you wish uh, later, but uh, I'll end uh, there. You're muted, Anna. Uh, sorry, thank you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely excellent and also so important because uh, uh, you know as you were speaking I was reminded of uh, the kinds of um, discussions that have been going on here uh, since uh, the COVID pandemic started and very early on of course you will remember that one of the kinds of discussions that came up was uh, well you know if you actually think about um, what's really killing Indian children or Bangladeshi children or Pakistani children, uh, the chances are that it's diarrhea or TB or something like that and not COVID. And why, yes, exactly. And why is that not being discussed? So it's, thank you so much for this and putting all these different kinds of strands on board. Uh, perhaps the title didn't do justice to the really complex set of issues that you were uh, speaking about, but it was provocative. And I think that brought lots of interest as well. So thanks a lot. Uh, before handing it over to Rachel to take on from here, I just want to make a small uh, announcement to 
those friends who have joined us for the first time, we normally encourage people to write in their questions, which we then read out. That gives more time to the speaker. Uh, should somebody find it very difficult to type, do let us know and then you can ask a question. Thank you. Rachel? Thank you. Um, we uh, already have a question in the chat box. So I'll read it out. It's from Sunita Nair. As a historian, how would you respond to the difference between hesitancy and refusal towards vaccination, which is being promoted through WHO? That too, based on determinants. So, I mean, my response would be that it's context specific. It's deeply context specific. So, so you know, uh, if you're asking me to use my historical evidence data from the smallpox eradication program, you know, in late 1960s, there was a massive outbreak which created uh, nervousness in Geneva and New Delhi about how big a, this smallpox epidemic outbreak was going to be. Even in a uh, state like Bengal, where there was a fear that the pandemic would go, West Bengal, there's a, there a fear that the pandemic would go out of control. There was variation. And the variation uh, came from, mul was caused by multiple issues uh, in the sense that urban vaccination programs, which were better organized, better explained, ten tended to have a higher uptake uh, in, in sort of well-heeled parts of, let's, of cities like Calcutta, but were brought forth a very different response in, in, the, sl in the slum areas of Calcutta, where the official response or official communication about the disease was different. So, so the opposition and hesitancy was being determined by how teams of international and national workers were behaving with the people they wanted to vaccinate. Of course, there was also different sets of grievances in these populations to political and economic structures. And that clearly had a role also in, in, in determining civilian uptake or responses to the calls for broadened vaccination programs. So at that point, it really didn't matter to many of these people whether the WHO was involved or not. The point is that the WHO was seen to be working with structures that were being opposed and therefore vaccination was being opposed. So what many historians often forget is the WHO is not just its headquarters in Geneva. The WHO is also its regional office in uh, New Delhi. And that regional office in New Delhi then negotiates with different state governments about what it will do in partnership with state government officials. And because those negotiations were also variable and uptake of WHO offer of help was also variable, it then stood it, it, it then resulted in a variable set of vaccination policies, which then stoked a very variable set of responses. So I'm, I'm very sorry, but what I'm trying to highlight is that there are complexities at every level, which then end up creating a very complex, very multifaceted public health program, which stokes equally complex responses. I wonder if Ms. Naya, that answers your question. Thank you, Professor. Um, 
we have typed in questions and also requests for asking questions. So what I'll do is I'll read the questions that are already there in the chat box and then uh, get back to those people who want to uh, ask the question directly. So the next query is from Dr. Srinivasa Kakilaya. Um, it appears that the quote-unquote resistance for smallpox came from ordinary people who were not clear about what was being done and about the benefits, maybe because it was something new. But with regard to COVID, some of the strongest voices questioning these vaccines have been of top-class vaccine scientists who in turn were branded as anti-vaccine, anti-government, and even anti-national. Is there any such history in the past? So, I mean, Dr. Srinivas, I mean, I agree and I disagree with you in the sense that resistance from, to smallpox vaccination did not just come from ordinary people. It Resistance existed at all levels. And, and that comes out when you read unpublished uh, WHO material and discussions with national and state government authorities. For example, uh, I read a wonderful file where in sort of when the intensification program, intensified program of the smallpox eradication uh, campaign um, uh, was started in the 1967-68, there were discussions about uh, whether uh, national and state officials should be given quotas about how many vaccinations to carry out in a specific period of time to make sure that herd immunity was created in, in specific uh, uh, parts of India, which were considered to be uh, more prone to smallpox uh, uh, th than others. And one of the things that came out in that chain of correspondence uh, was that often in states like Bihar or Eastern Uttar Pradesh, you know, it was some, sometimes very powerful, the landed elite who would oppose uh, smallpox vaccination or any attempt at organized smallpox vaccination programs. And, and uh, one report sticks to my mind, which uh, from the ground, which said that, you know, one very landed and powerful person uh, in Bihar uh, basically told the local vaccinator that, look, you need to meet your quota. You, don't, you leave my family alone. I'll make sure that all the landed uh, labor that works on my land will get vaccinated and that way you'll get your numbers. So it was just a reminder to me that, you know, even voluntary vaccination, you know, these terminologies are complex. They were not often voluntary. voluntary. They were just told or forced to get vaccinated for numbers, you know. How numbers are massaged uh, is, needs to be studied. We historians can do that, uh, not to debunk uh, claims of progress, but to tell bureaucratic structures or help bureaucratic structures understand that, that you know, implementation brings a lot of power to the people who implement. Uh, bringing transparency to the numbers is epidemiologically useful because it gives you a proper idea of what the situation is exactly on the ground. So again, it's a roundabout way of answering, pro answering your question. But also I'd like to point out that smallpox was a much dreaded disease. One of the similarities between the colonial and the post-colonial period was that government structures often felt that they couldn't win. And why couldn't they win? Because when there was a smallpox outbreak or an epidemic, people would um, rush for vaccination and demand vaccination because they were so scared of the disease. It was a very visible disease. It killed a lot of people. 30 to 50% of people died uh, once they contracted smallpox um, uh, variola major, the more virulent form of uh, the smallpox virus. Uh, 
Andaman would shoot her. But when smallpox was not in outbreak mode, the demand for vaccination would fall in all sections of society. And that is when the government would have had massive stocks of smallpox vaccine, but very little appetite uh, to, uh, uh, for people to take up the vaccine. So, so there are lessons there uh, for the COVID uh, conundrum you face now. You know, there are peaks of vaccine demand and then there are falls in vaccine demand. And I think the countries that are succeeding in, in, in beating back the current pandemic are the ones who are better able to negotiate that fall in vaccine demand, as well as the peak. Uh, so the peak, if hundreds of thousands of people want to get vaccinated and you have a million vaccines, that's not such a problem. But if you have a million vaccines and no one wants to get vaccinated, how do you then develop a public health communication strategy that explains that another wave might be coming again, but get vaccinated because that then protects your community, your family and yourself. So, so that's another point. Uh, yes, uh, there were some scientific, leading scientific minds who had their own theories about why smallpox happened. Sir Leonard Rogers, who had been a formative role to play, uh, had a formative role to play in the formation of the Calcutta School of Tropical Hygiene, uh, for instance, believed it was all linked to environmental factors and the amount of humidity in the air, uh, and that the smallpox eradication program of the 60s and uh, 70s was not really paying sufficient attention to this. And I found a series of handwritten and typed letters that he sent to WHO headquarters in Geneva and, and the Delhi office making his point. Uh, and he clearly had supporters because you know he was a retired official, but he had his admirers. Uh, but the point I tried to make during the talk was there were multiple voices, some more inclusive, some less inclusive, some voices that talked about true democratic collaboration and cooperation and cultural respect for communities. Others believed in efficiency as equal to just shut people up, forcibly vaccinate them, reach your numbers and walk off. You know, no need to talk to these people. Smallpox eradication worked because of people who were more democratic, who had empathy for the communities they were working in, spoke louder and were heard more clearly than the other lot. So there was always difference. Uh, and I think there are lessons to be learned for the smallpox eradication, uh, from the smallpox eradication pro program in that regard, in relation to what is happening in every country in the world in relation to COVID-19. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I think the next question in the chat box relates to what you just said. Um, Akshay asked, in current work with Adivasi and DNT communities, we are seeing a strong resistance to the vaccine stemming, vaccine stemming not simply from uncertainty or misinformation, but rather from deeply held histories of relationships with the state marked by violence. Do you have any suggestions from the smallpox experience for strategies in dealing with this situation. In brackets, apart from long-term working on reconfiguring the state's relationship with marginalized communities. Yeah, absolutely. Because again, I mean, you know, some of the most marked resistance to the final stages of smallpox eradication program and the vaccination campaigns that attended that final stage came in the Adivasi communities in Eastern India, uh, in, in, in what is now Jharkhand, was then Bihar, uh, uh, in West Bengal. And in fact, uh, uh, some of the most uh, touching uh, uh, narratives that have been prepared by our friend uh, Subramaniam Aka Larry Brilliant uh, relate to that, where uh, it, 
I, I can dig up the material and send it to, there's a little article he wrote about this. I can send it to Anu if people were interested, she can redistribute. I think it's open access. It's not uh, got any copyright issues or I can write to Larry and request him to send that to Anu so that, uh, uh, you know, uh, it can be redistributed. But he writes about uh, this massive outbreak in the early 1970s that makes many people very, very nervous. Uh, I say many people because if you read the unpublished materials, uh, uh, and there are many sources of unpublished materials. I, I highlight this just in case someone listening to me uh, asks for mass shredding of WHO HQ archives, you know, that won't work. The, the material exists at multiple places and I'm not going to tell you where the material exists. So, you know, you can shred away, but we can still get to these narratives. Um, is that the sort of early 1970s uh, epidemic uh, was seen by many WHO officials as a useful epidemic because these officials felt that because smallpox, uh, the eradication program was making such strides that many political leaders had started to believe that the problem was over and had therefore stopped giving political support and financial support. And the early 1970s massive smallpox outbreak in India was considered by many WHO officials as useful because it reminded political leaders the problem had not gone away and unless there was action taken uh, uh, to vaccinate and, and, and create uh, isolation arrangements that were empathetic and, uh, and, and, and uh, sustainable, uh, that smallpox would come back. And then, you know, all the money that had been spent on, on the campaign would go waste. So it is in this context that they uh, found, uh, identified huge outbreak of smallpox uh, in, in basically Tatanagar area. Uh, uh, and this is when GRD Tata uh, and the Tata Corp actually comes in in a very big way. Uh, but, you know, in a Eurocentric, US centric, historical narrative, that contribution is usually wiped out. Uh, and it is here that Larry gets involved with Adivasi communities and he writes very feelingly about how he kicks open, or his team is kicking people's doors open, barging into their houses, flattening people on the ground, forcibly vaccinating them and he writes, very, very uh, feeling. It's one of the most powerful pieces I've read uh, of uh, as a personal narrative of an international worker working in India, where he flattens this tribal, uh, who's a tribal leader, who fights Larry, tries to uh, throw Larry off him, but Larry manages to hold him down, uh, manages to vaccinate him. And the moment the vaccination is done, the struggle subsides. So Larry gets up, the gentleman who's described as being venerable and you know, very sophisticated, you know, a very kindly gentleman, sort of dusts himself off and uh, then says to Larry that uh, you have come to do your duty. My duty was to fight you. I have lost, you have won. Now our gods will tell us who is right, depending. And then he goes uh, to his garden and there's a brindle in one of his, sort of in his garden, a very, you know, a man of not many means. And he takes the brindle and gives it to Larry and said, you're a guest in my house. So I have to give you a gift, you know? So we have to think through this cultural interaction thoughtfully. And I tried to do that. And when I tried to do that, what you're saying in relation to relationship with marked with violence was certainly true in that period as well. And, and what is very clear when you look at the papers and I was very fortunate to be able to trace down the personal papers of Indian workers, local community workers in that area. They're the ones who are constantly saying what you're saying uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, we have to reset our day-to-day -day relationships 
uh, with the Adivasi communities to generate trust. So this doesn't become a battle every time we come in, but becomes uh, a, a part of our day-to-day -day care of these communities. Uh, uh, and uh, so I absolutely agree with you. And, you know, I remember another communication trying to explain why resistance took place. They pointed out that the only visible state presence in some of those communities was the alcohol shop. So if the alcohol shop collecting alcohol taxes was the only visible sign of the state rather than a public health, primary health care center or health facilities, uh, then you know the idea of the state, especially uh, amongst women perhaps affected by domestic violence post drinking uh, is not a positive one. So these things have to be thought through very carefully. The state needs to be represented by good symbols, not just harmful symbols. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, may I request Dr. Mridhulipan to please uh, post uh, Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, I know I'm, uh, I didn't write down the question. Uh, I am not a historian, Dr. Sanjoy, but I really enjoyed your talk. And I had one or two questions and then an observation to make. The question was, how long after the outbreak did the vaccine get developed? That was one question. And the second was, which is a little surprising to me, that it seemed even in the 19th century that there was production capacity to produce vaccines. You know, That was a bit surprising. So these are the two sort of questions I wanted to ask. The third is an observation whether, uh, and my interest, I'm going to the small, I'm talking about the smallpox uh, uh, situation. And uh, my interest in this was also, um, you know, it, it came up because uh, Center for Development Studies where I am, uh, there was a, a very uh, interesting paper which came out called the social intermediation and health transition. I don't know whether you had a chance to have looked at it. It was quite some time back by Dr. T. N. Krishnan and uh, M. Kabir. And what they say is what you're saying about the human resources, about the empathy and things like that, that, that in Kerala, the, now Kerala, it was the British Malabar. In the British Malabar, actually the smallpox vaccine came first before it came to Travancore and Cochin, the more progressive in their states. But how it was actually uh, communicated, administered there, is the lesson to be learned if any region wants to actually have a health transition even within a generation? That's the paper that he's written, that you could have the health generation, the health transition in a generation's time if you actually had this whole aspect of social mediation, where you even had the vaccinators who came from the different castes. You had a lot of empathy with the people who had to be vaccinated. He's got a whole lot of things written up on what he calls the social mediation. So I, I think that's a very important point you're making. It was not that superstition did not exist. There was there. The Kali goddess will, you know, share, you know uh, wreak its uh, wrath on those who get vaccinated. But he said that was not at all an important thing. The more important thing was that the, the, the state at that time, by some means, was able to socially mediate, socially intermediate, that's what he calls it. And that seems to have really brought about, uh, you know, acceptance for the vaccination and then a lot of good in Malabar. And of course, later it came to the other stately, uh, the princely states also. So I, I just wondered if you had come across this uh, paper. It was written some time ago because Krishnan is no more. I'm forgetting now what year was it but it was social intermediation and health transition. And Malabar was the uh, region that he studied. Okay. No, thank you. I was not aware of the paper, but I will chase it up. Uh, so to go back to your first question, um, so smallpox vaccine production in more organized forms than the way Jenna did it, which was basically to go to cows, scrape the udders of pustular material, and then transfer it uh, 
to human beings as vaccination uh, uh, developed very quickly after Jenner's paper was published. And by the early 1800s, there were production units both in London and Edinburgh. Uh, but what was quickly found out was that whilst those production units, vaccine production units uh, in, in London, Edinburgh, whose job was basically to collect cowpox and that cowpox was created by taking a cow that had cowpox, scraping out that material and then giving it to healthy cows and then harvesting the pox that then resulted through this act of transference and then putting it into little glass vials or lead vials and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, sealing them with wax, packing them in sort of cooling material and then transferring them around the country sort of worked when the transference was within the United Kingdom, but failed quite spectacularly when the transference was attempted from London and Edinburgh uh, to British India. So when you read about the arrival of the first uh, uh, batch in Bombay, uh, and there are in Maharashtra State Aga is a wonderful archive, you know, narratives about what happened, many of the batches arriving from the United Kingdom just would not work. They, they were reported as not taking, which is what then created uh, the appetite to create similar production units in, uh, in, in different British Indian provinces. So Bombay was the first one. But when we talk about 19th century production units, again, we have to be careful not to be presenters. These weren't shiny uh, uh, sort of factories. Uh, uh, like factories, I thought. Huh? Yeah, yeah, they were like uh, advanced gorshalas more than uh, factories. I mean, you only see the more recognizable uh, sort of uh, systematic production uh, in the 20th century. And what is very, very striking is that the British in India did invest heavily in the smallpox vaccination production units. So much so that uh, when you had international delegations coming in in the 1930s or during the 1940s during the Second World War, there was great surprise about how modern some of these facilities looked in relation to European and American facilities doing the same. And that was partially because this was a disease that knew no race, it, you know, it could kill everyone and therefore British investment in such vaccination production uh, units had a hint of self interest to it. Uh, uh, but both British India and independent India, we must never forget, gained a huge amount of political and diplomatic capital by delivering smallpox vaccine from these units to neighboring countries uh, and other countries in Asia. So be it Nepal, be it Bhutan, uh, be it Thailand, India was not just producing vaccine uh, in the early 20th century and even after independence for itself, vaccine production and provision was very much a part of international relations under Nehru and very successful international relations, I might add. Uh, vaccine politics uh, in relation to smallpox was successful in Nepal, in Sri Lanka, Ceylon, uh, and in uh, Burma, uh, independent Burma, now Myanmar, uh, sending doctors uh, to serve and develop their health services was often a very important part of Nehruvian foreign policy uh, in the 1950s, often for forgotten. And there, smallpox vaccine uh, 
uh, delivery played a very, very important role. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you for, you know, I always learn something new whenever I speak and thanks to you and other colleagues, I've learned things new and, and I will follow up on this paper. It makes sense. I mean, uh, it fits the model I've just spoken about. I mean, uh, if the British were producing smallpox vaccine, not just to protect the people they were ruling, but themselves, uh, uh, then I suppose uh, from that point of view, you know, as, uh, in another context, another historian had once written, you know, medicine was a tool of empire. That way, I suppose the vaccine itself could be seen as a tool of empire yeah. as well. And therefore that then explains why British Malabar would have it before Cochin. Yeah, no, I mean, that is not what it was. That was surprising, of course, given Malabar as being a much laggard uh, region. But what was interesting was how they carried it out, you know, and like, for instance, even women vaccinators, women vaccinating women, you know, that sort of uh, social uh, and cultural thing they kept in mind. I was just thinking that maybe this paper would be useful for Akshay also, because, you know, they were, they, he talked about the lower castes and the upper castes and how, you know, they could bring all of them uh, onto the vaccination and they take them on board for vaccination. So uh, the Adivasis, you know, how we can actually uh, even look at the problems of the Adivasis. Maybe we should have, I mean, I, I don't like to do that. I don't like to segregate, but I think at some times it becomes necessary probably to enable it through maybe Adivasi vaccinators being trained to, to uh, vaccinate the Adivasis. As I said, I don't want to segregate, but sometimes it becomes a practical thing to do a thing like that. Thank you so much for giving me so much time to talk. I mean, the only thing I would add to that is that, you know, Niels Brimness in Oros University has written, I think, very powerfully and very effectively about the introduction of smallpox vaccination in British South India, uh, uh, in, in the Madras presidency. Uh, I think a very important point that he makes that is often disregarded is that when vaccination comes in, it displaces inoculation as an official policy. Because sometimes in historiographical imaginaries, virulation represents some pure original India and vaccination is sort of a marker of colonialism and they come in and there's a clash. Yes and no, because that's why I keep talking about variations. There are folk traditions of variolation, inoculation. And then in the 18th century, Inoculation is very much a part of British official policy where it existed. Uh, and, 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 and therefore, uh, these trends continue in the early 19th century, in the early 1800s. And when an effort is made by vaccination to displace variolation, we are seeing also a competition between two official uh, uh, two official uh, streams of policy. Both are official policy, but smallpox vaccination is trying to displace official smallpox variolation. So it's it's not as as uh, it's it's. It's a much more complex story than just vaccination coming in and slowly spreading. Vaccin when vaccination came in, it had to displace belief in multiple traditions, which also, one of which was also the British official state's variolation policy. That's why, you know, when I was talking about different types of tracks on variolation, we have to be careful about what we are reading because some of the tracks that denounce variolation are created by the British colonial state to justify the introduction of vaccination at a time when its own vaccination is not exact, is not based on exact science or is not reliable, but is denouncing the earlier practice, practice of variolation practiced by itself and its supporters. So there are interest groups within the colonial structures that are competing here. It's not a simple narrative of the colonial versus the colonized. There is also battle 
amongst the colonizers themselves, which need to be understood because once you understand that in complexity, you then realize which parts of the colonized are supporting one side of the argument and which side of the colonized are supporting another side of the argument. And then you have that socio-political complexity in analysis that I'm proposing to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have a second question from Dr. Srinivasa Patile. Uh, compared to the role played by the WHO in earlier vaccinations, where it probably was on par or even ahead of country leaderships in making decisions, does it now appear that the political leaderships of many countries have outrun the WHO in making and forcing COVID vaccine and the WHO is reduced to playing second fiddle? No, because it depends on how you see the WHO and how you see the national governments. So if we define the WHO as Geneva, which it isn't, then you we can provide a narrative that doesn't necessarily take into account the complexity of the WHO itself. The WHO was never a centralized organization. WHO was formed in 1948. It was formed uh, it, it's, 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 it's formation, discussions about its formation started in 45-46. When those discussions started in 1945-46, what made WHO unique was that people who would play a very important role in advising nationalist movements and, and uh, uh, nationalists who would take power in the newly independent countries played a role in designing the WHO. So be it in Egypt, be it from India, the Mudalir brothers played a very, very important role in the designing uh, of, 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 of the WHO and its negotiations with independent India. So, you know, if, if your question is in relation to smallpox eradication program, those who only look at WHO headquarters in Geneva come up with the fiction that the smallpox eradication program was created because some European interests and some American interests got together and convinced WHO headquarters that smallpox eradication was necessary. But if you look at the issue and complexity and look at what was being said at the regional office committee level, what countries were telling the regional office, what countries were saying in the World Health Assembly, which was a one vote, one country system, which very democratic, more democratic than anything that existed before in, in international health administration. That is where you see that countries like India, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Ceylon then were coming together to demand smallpox eradication because it was a problem in the region. So, in a sense, the smallpox eradication program seen in this way emanates as an act of hope in an organization that is seen as a symbol of hope in an area of decolonization. So if you look at the WHO that way, then the WHO uh, 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 was responding to member states even then. And the WHO is an organization of the member state and non-state actors have always tried to control decision-making and resource allocation via WHO. That's another game. So, you know, now you have the Gates Foundation trying to do that consistently, the polio eradication program being a very powerful symbol of such attempts at capture of the organization. Uh, you know, you have the Rockefeller uh, Foundation trying to do that during the malaria eradication program. And that sort of capture takes place at the headquarter level. Yeah, but the headquarter level is a technical advisory body. Its role is to provide technical advice. When it comes to implementation, headquarters has very small role to play. That is where the devolved regional office system comes into play. And that is where you see a different kind of negotiations happening between member states and the regional offices. And unless that history is studied and written, we will keep getting trapped as historians or public health analysts in this Eurocentric, uh, US-centric sort of, sort of uh, I don't know, fiction fest, if I could call it, uh, that 
is very dangerous because that fiction is used as an artificial history to justify future resource allocation and future resource decision making. So historians have a very active role to play in countering these narratives. We often don't. And of course, there's a problem. I mean, as a brown historian sitting in the UK, I'm very aware of the fact that they listen to me or listen to my arguments or listen to my complaints because I'm in a leading UK university. So, you know, to democratize, to decolonize the WHO, we have to fight to make sure that they listen to a historian of Kerala as carefully as they listen to a historian at the University of York. And, but to fight that fight, there has to be some self-realization as well. And sometimes sadly, that self-realization in the brown diasporic scholar, scholar does not exist. How does this link to the question you're asking? Is because, you know, if we think that this is only about countries and uh, WHO, then we're missing a massive, uh, massive elephant in the room here, global pharma. We are, we are missing the damaging, we are now paying for World Bank reforms of the 1980s that forced the closure of, of shiny, wonderful, effective vaccine production units funded by the taxpayer, therefore providing free vaccine at a time of need, like the one we are facing right now. So we are paying for that now, uh, but you know, historians, Many historians are, are aware of this, but not writing about this, not talking about this. Why? Because they're worried about the ne next research grant. So we have to understand that big elephant in the room. And that is the marketization of higher education, the marketization of public goods. Um, and I, the word goods being uh, very important here. And if this pandemic doesn't allow a reset of how we think about our health and our education and how we hold power to account, then I think, you know, all these sacrifices in life will have gone to waste. I mean, you know, uh, the Serum Institute of India is now a private company. There was a time when there was a bigger company that was public, not only helping the whole of India, but helping the entire South Asian subcontinent. Uh, helping build bridge, helping win India political capital. Vaccine, Maitri works to an extent, but the idea only works if there is true commitment to uh, the value, the, to us agreeing that all life is valuable, not the lives of a few, but all lives. So that moral commitment is very difficult to get from farmer interests where the priority is uh, stakeholder profits. So uh, I don't, I think, you know, if at the current moment, I think the scales have fallen off the senior administrators uh, in WHO HQ in Geneva's eyes. I mean, they now realize that all these people in pharma who had made all these promises are not keeping the promises and they have to look elsewhere and they have to now speak about the great betrayal, which they are now speaking about and all kudos to them. But there was a point of time when they actually believed that this market-based thing uh, would work and they promoted it through COVAX and now COVAX has failed disastrously as many of us had pointed out, but they chose to work with health economies primarily based in the US who who you know, corralled and explained evidence in ways, massaged evidence in ways that at that point justified their arguments about the great equity of COVAX. But the point is the whole point of COVAX was the Gates Foundation through Gavi trying to normalize the very expensive sale of vaccine through the World Health Organization when the messaging should have been that in a pandemic, no one should be making profits. Or even if there are profits being made out of a vaccine that has been produced out of massive public investment, then that use of that profit has to be taxed extra and then transferred to health system strengthening perhaps. I don't know. But uh, so it's not just about, so 
what these pharma industries are doing is they're lobbying and winning over support both within the WHO and uh, within governments. So, so the only people who are outrunning in terms of money making are the pharma interests. Uh, and the WHO and the national governments have now realized that they are struggling to uh, get close enough to these people to hold them by the collar and shake them down uh, for public good. So I think, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, our next query is from Matthew Evergis. Thanks a lot for the informed takes. I was disconnected for a short while. So possibly you referred to the aspects below. What roles do different distrusts of several kinds of doctors, of governments, or of health regimes be playing? This possibly also varies in accordance to the changing quote unquote social contracts in different states or nation states. Possibly the genealogies of the institutions, health or police are also playing their part. It was interesting to listen to your historical references. Also, it would be great if you could give perspectives on public science movements vis-a-vis -vis perceptions of medical outputs or action. So he has continued to say that, was thinking of a place like Netherlands where there has been a national platform of open science, a forum where the university, state and public in ways converge. I thought of that as one example as against other places when I mentioned divergent state orders and the way science is communicated. Okay, uh, that's a lot to unpack there. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you're absolutely right. There are different types of distrust and therefore different types of hesitancy and resistance as well. It's re resistance does not just come from, uh, or hesitancy does not just exist in communities and how we define community is very important because for me, public health and medical implementers are part of communities. So there is this overlap. If there's a Venn diagram, it's the overlapping sort of circle bit. Uh, and if new public health interventions or pandemic response goals and impacts uh, or expected impacts are not explained, not just uh, to civilian populations that will receive uh, the vaccine that is being rolled out. Uh, but, but if it's not explained to the people whose help you need to roll out the vaccines, then it's very likely uh, historical data from smallpox eradication shows uh, that you, it is very, very likely then uh, that there'll be resistance within bureaucratic uh, and medical and public health structures, which will then seep into communities and thereby create new foci of resistance and hesitancy. So it's layers and layers of hesitancy caused by layers and layers of issues uh, and uh, an effective internal communication strategy at least makes it more likely, uh, historical data from smallpox eradication shows that the few layers that are then stoked by bureaucratic doubt or doubt amongst public health workers can then be avoided at a later, later stage. So that would be my answer. Uh, Yes, I mean, the police were involved in some of these forcible uh, vaccination programs. Paul Greeno wrote a very, very powerful article on intimidation and coercion in the smallpox eradication program in South Asia, which I would recommend to all of you in social science and medicine. But Paul, who's a very good friend of mine and I, he and I fight like cats and dogs and uh, we, we are great friends because we always agree to disagree. We don't sort of, it doesn't become an ego issue between us. He's much older than I and the wonderful gentleman, but 
but uh, I'm very respectful of him. But, you know, I had to point out to him that, you know, that article he had written in Social Science and Medicine that I wrote was also a result that his bias came from his white guilt. And while I applauded him for being guilty, uh, I did tease him that his guilt uh, uh, had caused him to ignore uh, brown involvement in intimidation and coercion. Uh, and he didn't in initially believe me because at that time I didn't have the data, but then I did my research and found the data. And there's a very powerful episode he describes in, an, in that article where he says that it was like a military campaign where a village was surrounded and then these international workers went into this village, you know, with their jeeps were lighting up the village from all, uh, it encircled the village and their lights were on. And so, you know, there's a spotlight on the village and then these international workers went in, they kicked down doors, forcibly vaccinated men and women, and then left. And then once I'd done my research, I was able to, I think, convince Paul that you know, in these imaginaries of violence or power, state power, people forget how porous that power sometimes is. And, and so, you know, people were trying to run away from the villages since there were more people than international workers and uh, you know, vaccinators. But someone was grabbing hold of those people as they were trying to uh, escape the villages and throwing them back into the village where they were then finally caught by international workers and vaccinators. And those were brown policemen from the localities. So we have to be aware of these complexities uh, and we, we can take whatever political position we want on the use of such force. But the point is that uh, some of these international workers who liked to use force or who at a certain point thought force was okay had brown allies. And as historians, we need to write about both. We can't just present it in simplistic terms as sort of either just police action or just international action. Uh, in some cases, police who like to use violence were being told by international workers it's a great idea to use violence. They were getting international sanction to do what they were doing. So as historians, we have to look at all these aspects and that's what I try to do. And I would really recommend Paul Greenham's article to you and because he does discuss the role of different institutions, including the security forces and the police. Uh, public science movement, yes. You know, again, uh, I, I want to throw back at you uh, problems of I think definitional complexity, theoretical complexity, you know, words like solidarity, open access, wonderful, wonderful words, wonderful terms, you know, but we shouldn't be led by our noses into believing these are necessarily all good things. If as a result of open access, the publishing model of journals becomes such that only people who have money to publish can publish, then an openly accessible scientific platform is perhaps even more elitist than what it has replaced. So we have to remain aware of that. Open access is important, but we have to be aware of how that open access is being done, okay? If the model is that, you know, in a year, a journal publishes, let's say, 100 articles, and they say, okay, 50% of the articles are going to be funded by, again, a global charitable funder that pushes for um, open access. But that money gained from the 50% of the publications or the open science data. Uh, will then be used to fund the other 50 articles, which will be written by people who don't have access to such funds, but who pass peer review, then that's a more democratic system. Then you have an open science system. But if you have a system that says only those who have grants from Gates or the Wellcome Trust are good scholars, and because they have, how is their goodness or their excellence being defined? Because they have these grants from these bodies, so they're good. 
everyone else is bad and their scientific findings cannot be published because they don't have the money to publish in some of these leading journals, then that's not open science. They might call it open, but this is a Kafkaesque world where closed is open and open is closed, you know? So, so critical academics, we need to think about these things and question these things. It doesn't please the global funders. And I'm very aware that by saying these things, I might not get my next research grant, but I can't sell my soul for the next research grant. You know, I'm a teacher after all. And if I don't teach my students to think critically and at least try and make a better world, what is the point in me being in academia really? So, you know, I hope that answers your question. Um, if I've punctured your uh, uh, belief in, I mean, the Dutch system is privatizing in a way that I haven't seen before. So. There was a time I used to admire the Dutch system and they're the Cephes project and stuff like that right now. They've even sold their national vaccine production unit to a private provider. That is, I think, says it all about where the Dutch are beginning to stumble badly. Look what happened. They were at the back of the queue for the vaccine from Global Pharma. Wouldn't have happened if they had their own vaccine production unit. The world needs a reset. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Arunima. Mine is a historiographical slash research funding type question. Uh, where can we situate the literature on smallpox in relation to that on HIV, AIDS, Spanish flu, plague, etc.? Is there a hierarchy of available information or is it too simplistic to expect that? Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, Absolutely right. I mean, I mean, there are sort of, you see, some histories are more prominent than others because certain funders have been involved in supporting disease control programs. So, you know, HIV AIDS for me is a wonderful history of human rights and the victory of human rights approach uh, over an overly medicalized, profit driven approach. Uh, India has a role to play here. Yusuf Hamid had a huge role to play in that. I mean, that Fire in the Blood documentary, for those who haven't seen it on Netflix, must watch. One of my biggest disappointments, Yusuf Hamid is one of my heroes in global public health and in international global public health. His silence on lack of COVID vaccine justice has been a massive disappointment. Uh, if he has done that for the sake of his profits that his CIPLA will probably generate from producing one or two types of vaccine, then it's very disappointing because he showed us the way about how to stand up to global pharma and bring it to heel and how to create moral coalitions amongst uh, governments, rich countries and less developed countries, bring them together in the World Health Assembly and outmaneuver uh, global pharma, usually supported by one or two very rich countries. So he showed us the way, but you know, we need him back now. You know, he's in his 90s, he has to speak now. So, you know we don't see as much of this history as we see the smallpox eradication story, which is that big story. But also remember the reason we hear a lot more about smallpox eradication is because very artificial histories of smallpox eradication were deployed very politically and strategically to justify polio eradication and to justify very specific approaches uh, to uh, intervention in programs, more recent programs like Ebola. Uh, and, and currently, uh, artificial history is a smallpox eradication to justify a very US centric model of the notion of health security, where the idea of global solidarity that seems to be peddled seems to be one where space is created for global funders uh, like the Gates Foundation or the Wellcome Trust 
who are not answerable at all uh, to any national government uh, or, 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 or the electorate uh, to go in and dictate what happens in relation to health security. So we must understand that histories are not just interesting things we read during a holiday. Uh, you know, I mean, I love Dalimpu's writing and his new book on the anarchy and all that. There's a place for that. But there's also a very conscious battle for the historical narrative in, in all disease programs, current and future, uh, that we have to be aware of. Uh, and, you know, in these sort of narratives, the Spanish um, explications of the historical ex explications of Spanish flu and the different waves uh, have also been prevalent because, you know, I mean, historians are going to be, play a role, but as COVID has so many more waves than the Spanish flu ever had, hopefully that sort of lazy history writing will also slowly take a back seat and we will ask more pressing questions about structures and political fallibilities rather than uh, epidemiological idealizations. Uh, um, Yes, and you know, why was some archives are better maintained than others? Smallpox eradication archives I mentioned uh, uh, before are very well maintained, digitized. Why? Because it was the greatest achievement, uh, only human disease to have been eradicated successfully, uh, a, a eradication program that brought much kudos to the WHO at a time when the failure of the malaria eradication program was raising serious questions about the need for the World Health Organization. So there's a reason why archives exist, but we must also re remember that archives are not natural phenomena, but human pro hu result of human acts. So digitization is usually a good idea, but often digitization also leads to selection of what is digitized and what is made Public. So there's an act of censorship during digitization as well that worries me, which is why I made the point about multiple sources of information being important in smallpox eradication. And, and for the anthropologist uh, collaborator I work with, the silences that are created during uh, uh, digitization often tell me lots about the politics of how again, historical archives are being made and uh, being made available. So yes, um, uh, the plague is very important. I mean, the, uh, the, the material on, you know, the very relatively recent plague uh, outbreak in India involving Surat uh, and, and Gujarat uh, are now open. Um, but of course, you know, uh, some historians like Kavita Shiva Ramakrishnan have written small bits on it, but so much more to be written and study. But it takes courage because writing such critical histories means that you might not get your next research grant or then you become very careful. And when you become careful, then you can't critically describe things. But I think you have to get to my rather grand old age when you don't care anymore and then, you know, uh, I, I myself was guilty of being, I suppose, more careful earlier on in my life. Thank you. Um, we, with that, we've come to the end of students. Professor Adelina, over to you. Thank you. It's my absolutely wonderfully happy task to thank you, Sanjay. Um, it's uh, very rarely that a Q&A is even more exciting than the talk. <laughs> so thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. I think everybody here learned enormously. Um, as and when you get time, do share the pieces that you suggested. And if there's a reading list or list of films that you want us to watch, do let us know. And I truly hope you'll be able to come to Kerala. I and look that, forward to that. 
get past pandemic anxiety and hesitancy and start traveling more. I look forward to doing that. Thank you so much for inviting me and for your time. You've given me two hours more of your time and I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Okay. Be well, be safe, everyone. Get vaccinated. <laughs>